Yeah. Mm-hmm. I wake up to oh. a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. What's good, everyone? Welcome inside the Bucks Film Room podcast. My name is Brian Sampson. You can find me on Twitter at Bucks Film Room. I write about the Milwaukee Bucks for Forbes Sports. The goal of this podcast is to help you become more knowledgeable about the Milwaukee Bucks, more knowledgeable about basketball in general. We like to dive deep into some of the details and sets and strategies, different schemes that we're seeing, talking about how the Bucks are approaching it on the court, what we're seeing, and, and really going through a lot of film. Today, we have a smorgasbord of topics that we're going to talk about related to the Bucks. We're going to talk about their process. We're going to go through the schedule that they're in the midst of and really how difficult that is. Injuries are starting to pile up the rotations and playing time that we're seeing from Doc Rivers. And then we're going to go through some trade slops since the trade deadline is on t- on Thursday. Um, so this recording this podcast for you all on a Wednesday and the trade deadline is on Thursday. So we're going to go through the latest trade slop. There's a lot of different directions the Bucks will possibly go or could possibly go. Uh, they lost to the Phoenix Suns on Tuesday night. It was another close game, another encouraging loss. Even though the losses are piling up, the process is a lot better. We'll dive into that. Uh, Milwaukee did some trapping on defense once again, which is a lot more difficult against a team like the Phoenix Suns when they have Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, and Kevin Durant compared to the Mavericks who just have Luka. But Milwaukee did some more trapping. Their defense held up. The defense played well. Shouldn't feel too bad. Milwaukee's offense just could not get it going. But Damian Lillard out the entire game with an ankle sprain. Chris Middleton only played eight minutes, and then he left with an ankle sprain. Brooke Lopez was out. So really down two and a half, three starters right there. We'll dive into some more of those injuries, but overall Milwaukee shouldn't feel too bad even though the losses continue to pile up. The defense was good once again. Their defense held their own, which is really what we should be looking at most, uh, focusing on right now primarily is their defense. Their offense struggled, but, but that's predictable. No Dame, no Middleton, basically no Middleton, and no Brooke Lopez. Giannis, he's playing awesome. He looks really good. With Embiid out, I think Giannis, if the, when the wins start piling up, I think Giannis will make a late MVP push. He's really playing the best that that I've ever seen him. Uh, the, the way that he is seeing the floor, the way that he's balancing being aggressive and finding open teammates is really nothing short of amazing. He's been awesome, awesome this year. I, I tweeted something out before yesterday's game that Giannis has 444 made shots in the restricted area this season, which leads the NBA. The difference between him and Zion Williamson, who's in second with 274, is the same as the difference between Zion and Jimmy Butler, who's in 85th place. So that's just amazing. He's really getting into the paint at will, despite defenses always trying to stop him. He had another kind of near triple-double, I think 34 points, 10 rebounds, and 6 assists against the Suns. So we've been seeing some really great things with him this year. We just have to, the, the wins are going to come. So let's, let's just dive right into it. Let's just talk about the process under Doc Rivers that we've seen so far. The, the wins aren't there yet. They will be there. Trust me, the wins will come. They look a lot better right now than they did under Adrian Griffin, despite going 30 and 13 under Adrian Griffin and one in four now only under Doc Rivers. We're going to dive into the schedule that they're in the midst of, which is really, really tough stretch, but their process looks a lot better on both ends of the court. And Rivers has a lot of work to do. So he's jumping in, really trying to adjust the defense on the fly. Defense is where they've made most of their changes. And that's where he's implementing more of his stuff. We saw the trapping defense again against the Suns. Expect that to probably be a part of their normal strategy. They want to get the ball out of the opposing team's best players, best playmakers, but you have to mix that up. You can't send the trap from the same player or from the same angle, same spot on the court every single time. You have to mix that up to keep those offensive players guessing, keep them on their heels a little bit, but then your rotations have to be crisp behind them. Doc Rivers talked pregame, I think it was just pregame before Thursday or before Tuesday or maybe on Monday, 
how they had a practice where the coaches couldn't speak and it was only the players, or maybe it was a shoot around where he talked to his team about, do they see themselves as a low talking team, a medium talking team or a high talking team? And they all said low, which is surprising when you have this many veterans. So why is talking so important on defense? I think this part can get lost in the understanding of people's games. So talking is incredibly important on defense, not just to know, you know, who's guarding the ball, who's on ball, but where's your help at? If you're in the middle of the floor, how are you guarding that player? If you're on the side of the floor, how are you guarding that player? If there's a ball screen come coming, not just from who, not just from what angle, but what's the coverage behind you? Because the coverage that the role man's defender is playing is going to dictate how the on-ball defender is going to play. It's going to dictate how the help is going to play. It's going to dictate what that next step in the rotations are going to look like. So it really tilts and sets up your whole defense for that portion. So that communication is incredibly important on defense to be able to talk to each other constantly, be able to pick each other up in rotations, especially. So that's really something that was surprising to hear that they see themselves as a low talking. Look for the defense to continue to improve especially the communication in the last eight games, AKA since Adrian Griffin was let go, the bucks have a 113.7 defensive rating, which ranks seventh in the NBA. Justin Garcia had a nice tweet as well, uh, pointing out that in five of those eight games, the bucks have played a team with a top 10 offense. So they're not just playing the bottom of the barrel. They're playing some really good offenses here and getting some really good results. The bucks can stay in the seven to 10 range. They will be just fine. Their offense has actually been slow. Their offense has been uh, what's been holding them back from a better record here that I have complete confidence. They just have too many talented players. They'll turn it around on offense. That should be the least of our concerns. Uh, Doc Rivers is trying to implement some new things on offense as well. He's trying to work in the Giannis and Damian Lillard two-man game. He really wants to, I think, spam that and get that going at a high level. He talked about how they've been very good, but that they should be killers uh, in that pick and roll. He's also then trying to work in Chris Middleton as a third option or tertiary option. Off, the, off of that Middleton Dame two man game. And then when you surround them with players like Brooke Lopez, Malik Beasley, that unit can really get clicking. We shouldn't be too worried about the offense yet. Rivers is still learning the verbiage uh, under a Adrian Griffin. He's seen a lot of their stuff, but he's still trying to learn what it's called. And so that, that communication just takes a little bit of time. Again, they've only had one practice. They're using those extended shoot arounds, which they can only do. You really want the players' buy-in. So when I say you can only do for another week or two, what that really means is players are going to really push back at that. We've seen some really tired legs. We've seen some heavy minutes that these Bucks players are playing. The shoot rounds have a little bit more oomph right now because players are trying to prove that they should be on the court. It's a new coaching staff. You don't have training camp. You don't have preseason games. You don't have all this time to prove that you belong in the court. So the shoot rounds are are playing at a at an intensity level more like practice but you can only do that for so long this is a long season starts in what october goes to the middle of april that is quick on the fly what six months and when you have all of these games baked in here your players need rest rest is crucial uh contrary to what the nba says uh rest is very important to the longevity and long-term health the Bucs are not trying to win games in January and in February. That's why they fired Griffin, 30-13 and 13 record, but they weren't trending in the right direction. They're trying to set themselves up for success in April, June, or April, May, and June, even if it means taking some bumps right now. So really stay patient, everybody. Promise you, things will get better. These wins will follow very quickly. Milwaukee just has a lot going on between their schedule, between a brand new coach, between injuries starting to pile up. But the process is there, and the process is more important than results. Uh, the process is why the Bucks fired Mike Boonholzer. You know, the results are there, but the process, especially in the playoffs, were not, was not there. Process is why the Bucks fired Adrian Griffin. The wins were there, but the process was nowhere near it. It should have been. And now, under Rivers, it does look a lot better. Just be patient here. Let's see how things turn out. There's still a lot of regular season left for Milwaukee to, go, to get going. They're playing a lot of catch up. 
it, it one thing that just struck me it's crazy we're talking about process doc rivers has a history of not coaching so well in the playoffs we'll just say but when we went from Boonholzer to agent griffin i think the bar is so low now rivers who is just coaching at a competent level it just it, that turnaround or that jump is I guess once again, just shocking for all of us of the bar was so low under Griffin. Now under Rivers, we're simply talking about competent schemes on both ends of the court. And that being the bar, maybe that's all it'll take for this Bucks team. Maybe they will have enough offensive firepower to get them over the hump in the playoffs in that half court game when the game slows down, as long as their defense can be in that seven to 10 range, maybe even seven to 15. If the defense can just hold their own, in the postseason and the offense gets humming and clicking like like we know they can, maybe that's all it takes. It's just ironic that that's where we're at after five years of Boonholzer and years of Boonholzer being called to be fired. Now we're kind of back to the bar that Boonholzer had set where last summer we were looking, the Bucks were looking to raise that bar. One thing as far as the results, like I said, Bucks are only one in four under Doc Rivers. I think they're one in two um, before he took over with Joe Prunty as interim coach because they're in the midst, midst of a brutal schedule. I tweeted this out as well, but they're in the midst of a 21-day period where they play 12 games in seven different cities that includes four back-to-backs and also includes four games four of the three games in four nights. So they played Phoenix today. They're on Tuesday, off day Wednesday. Then they have another back-to-back Thursday against the Timberwolves and Friday against the Hornets. Thankfully, both of those games at least are in Milwaukee. But this is just a very, very tough schedule for the Bucs right now, which is part of why we're seeing them struggle to, to with the results portion. But let's just go through this brutal schedule that they're in the middle of. It started back in January 26 with a home game against the Cleveland Cavaliers. They had a back-to-back the next night on January 27th against the New Orleans Pelicans. They were off on January 28th, right back at it on January 29th with a game at the Denver Nuggets. That was the first of their three games in four nights and also kicked off a five-game road trip that they just concluded. So January 29th off at Denver, January 30th, or sorry, January 29th at Denver, January 30th off the 31st at Portland, right back at it. And then this is the only February 1st and February 2nd is the only two day stretch where they've had consecutive days with no games um, until later this week. So February 1st and February 2nd off right back at it with another back to back February 3rd at Dallas, February 4th at Utah, February 5th off February 6th, Tuesday night at Phoenix. So that's another three days and four stretch where they went one and two would have gone two and one if it wasn't for an awful fourth quarter against the jazz. So they're just a couple of quarters here and there away from being three and two being four and one under rivers. So then they're off on Wednesday, the seventh, right back at it with another double header, uh, double header, another back to back February 8th versus the Timberwolves, February 9th versus the Hornets. Then they have two days off February 10th, February 11th. That'll feel like a very long vacation, but then right back at it with another back to back on the 12th against Denver. And then on the 13th against Miami, two very quality opponents off on Valentine's day, then right back at it on February 15th at Memphis. So that's really their tough schedule that they're in the middle of. Then they get a little break for All-Star Game. Giannis will be there. Dame will be there. Beasley's going to be in the three-point contest, it was reported. But then following the All-Star break, eight of their next ten games after that are on the road. This is a brutal brutal stretch that they're in the middle of. And this is why their start was so concerning. Over the first half of the season, they had a cupcake schedule. That was a cakewalk. That was easy. They should have been more than 30 and 13. That was the time to pile on those wins. That way you can sustain a little bit of a drought here in February and January in heading into March. But this, this is... And the Bucs are going to have to grind out some of these wins. They're really going to have to start to... Pull it together. Um, I, I'm I'm confident in that. As we look at the standings on the morning of Wednesday, February 7th, the Celtics are in first place in the Eastern Conference at 38 and 12. They have some room there in between them and the Cavs, who are now Cavaliers have won nine of their nine of their last ten games and six in a row. They have passed the Bucks, so the Cavs are now in second place in the East, five back of the Celtics. 
The Bucks are actually now tied for third with the Knicks if at uh, 33 and 18. They're both five and a half game back. So only half a game back between the Bucks and Knicks and the Cavs. But then the 76ers are there in fifth um, at 30 and 19. They obviously have their own injury woes to deal with. I wouldn't be so concerned with them. But Milwaukee's in a battle. They could end up as the four seed this year, which would be different. The four seed would be tough. A tough pill to swallow for them. You want to avoid the Celtics until the Eastern Conference Finals. So if the Bucs can get in that two to three slot, that would be a lot better. Obviously, there's a lot of time. There are only 51 games in, still 31 games remaining. But just something to keep an, keep an eye on is this schedule is brutal. Be prepared for more losses. I'm not going to say expect them because I think that Bucks are going to turn their corner at some point here. But be prepared for that, especially because those injuries are piling up. Damian Lillard has an ankle sprain. He suffered it Saturday against the Mavs, but did, said he didn't really know where it came from. But then we saw in Utah when he threw down on Walker Kessler that he came up hobbling, and he probably shouldn't have played uh, Monday night or Sunday night as well. He probably should have just rested that. There's no reason to gut it out. This is not like a Portland Trailblazers team where we absolutely need – Dame on, on the court every single night to fight through these injuries. It's more about that long term, keep him healthy. But we'll see how long he's out for. Um, we'll see what that looks like. Chris Middleton sprained his ankle, landed on Katie's foot on a jump shot, which that that's concerning. That's a that's a tough another ankle sprain. Doc Rivers said the X-rays were negative, but Chris Middleton was reportedly in a walking boot and on crutches after the game. Those ankle sprains are nothing to mess with. They can linger. They can be sore, but hopefully nothing long term. If he's in, if he was in walking boots, if he was in a walking boot and on crutches after the game, I'm expecting that he'll miss some time. Um, we're what a week, a little over a week away from the All Star break. Maybe he'll miss these next however many games that we have. Let's see how many games we have before the All Star break. One, two, three, four, five. Maybe he'll miss these next five games. That's a tough pill to swallow. He was really getting going, really finding a stride here, but at least it's not anything knee related. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll be a sneaky way to give his knee a week, two week break here in the middle of this season. Brooke Lopez has been out for the last few games, but that's more good news. Uh, I think his wife had a baby. Um, so that's good. You know, give him some time with that. He'll be back soon. Doc Rivers, even with all of these guys out, he's kept his rotation short, which is concerning for me. On Tuesday night, Giannis played another 39 minutes. Jay Crowder played 40 minutes. Bobby Portis had 31. Malik Beasley had 36. Pat Connaughton had 32. So that's really, that's a lot of minutes. His rotation was short. I would love to see Andre Jackson Jr. Where, where is he? Do we need to put up a missing persons poster for him? Do we need to put him on a milk cart? Like what's going on? He should not he should be in the rotation. He's proved that much. And I think that's part of the hard part with Doc Rivers is Rivers hasn't seen a lot of him. You know, he wasn't part of the coaching staff that scouted him, that drafted him just several months ago. But Andre Jackson Jr. can help this team out. He's long. He's athletic. He's a defensive-minded player. Let's get him out there, get him some run. Pat Connaughton should not be playing 32 minutes. Shea Crowder should not be playing 40 even just cutting both those guys down to 25 minutes. There's 17 minutes for Ajax right there. Uh, I mean, it, that's just something that I would love to see more from Rivers. I know he knows these veterans. He has a propensity. You know, this is not the first stop where he's played or leaned heavily on veterans. But I think Andre Jackson Jr. has earned that. A.J. Green got some good run again against the Suns, which he's looked good. He didn't make a shot. He was 0 for 4. But his defense, he battles on defense. He's not the most athletically gifted on that end of the floor. Lacks athleticism, especially lateral lateral quickness. But he, he works hard. He does a great job putting his chest into, into ball handlers. Doesn't foul. So I would like to see Green get some more run. Ajax, you got to get him in this rotation. And Bochamp, I mean... Maybe this was a time to showcase him before the trade deadline since they are shopping him. That could have backfired. I've never been high on Champ. He's had some decent moments. In theory, he looks like a 3 and D player, but he just hasn't been able to consistently knock down the three, and he hasn't been cons able to consistently play defense. Um, I'm, I've been a big fan of there are way more – 
There's more ways to prove your worth and your value than playing in an NBA game. Practices, G League, there's a lot of ways to to prove your value. I, I just have never been that high on champ, but I think that there's still a couple of young guys the Bucks can look at getting into their rotation. They might have to. I mean, you can't continue to play these veterans, these old guys, 35 to 40 minutes in February game, especially with these back-to-back. Giannis played heavy minutes in their last back-to-back. You saw him grabbing at his back um, against the Suns, but was able to continue to play through it. We'll see how that, that rolls out. Doc Rivers is going to have to do something. I think he's going to have to extend his rotation, whether he likes it or not. He's going to kill these guys playing them 35 to 40 minutes. Speaking of champ, we uh, speaking of Bochamp, of Pat Connaughton, of Bobby Portis, th- we might have seen one of those guys or a couple of those guys for the last time in a Bucks uniform. The Bucks trade or the NBA trade deadline is on Thursday. We got some Bucks trade slop for you. Going to go through the latest rumors. We'll see what plays out. Basically, the too long did not read version of this is Milwaukee's interested in a ton, a ton of players. They are interested in guys all across the league, really focused on a defensive upgrade for their team, especially on the perimeter. The real question is, does any team want what the Bucs have to offer? This really feels like an NBA 2K trade where you're throwing in what they want to throw in Bochamp, they want to throw in campaign and they want to throw in the Portland's 2024 second round pick for a defensive upgrade. Like eh, what team wants that? Like what, there has to be trade offers out there for a lot of these guys that will beat that um, Pat Connaughton campaign and 2024 second, just throw it together type deal. I, I think that'll really be the question is, does any opposing team want that? Do they want what the Bucks have to offer? That really seems to be Milwaukee's main trade bait that they're throwing out there. They've been hesitant to make a deal for Bobby Portis, or that includes Bobby Portis. It sounds like they're willing to include Portis in on a deal, but it would have to be for the perfect deal. So let's just start right there. Uh, Jake Fisher of Yahoo Sports reported that the Bucs are once again talking with the Golden State Warriors about Andrew Wiggins. The Bucks, in order to make that that salary work, would have to add Bobby Portis and I believe Pat Connaughton, both of them, in a deal. Uh, Jake Fisher talked about Steve Kerr likes Bobby Portis from their time on Team USA, which might be helpful. But Milwaukee is hesitant. They have to think long and hard. Wiggins is having a down season. On paper, Wiggins, again, can be that key cog in a championship team. He's lead athlete. Uh, plays good defense, he'd immediately step into the starting lineup in Beasley's role, move Beasley to the bench, with, which would help with some of that um, bench scoring and help negate some of the loss of Bobby Portis with the scoring in the second unit. But Wiggins has not been playing like that player all season long. He's been in a slump. He's got a huge contract. I think he makes about $24 million this year. It's going to continue to go up. So would Milwaukee do that? I mean, you wouldn't trade for this version of Andrew Wiggins. You'd be making the trade with the hopes that he can revert back to what we've seen from him on the past championship team with the Warriors. But that'll be interesting. Is that Wiggins still out there? Maybe, maybe not. I, I don't know. Another Bobby Portis rumor from Jake Fisher was a Bobby Portis for Grant Williams uh, swap with the Dallas Mavericks. Um, Mark Stein reported that these trades fell apart, but Fisher was saying the Bucks would want more than just Bobby Portis for Grant Williams. Grant Williams left the Celtics last summer, uh, signed with the Mavericks for a four-year deal, but he's been a disappointment. I mean, it, it can be a red flag if the Celtics are okay to move on from Grant Williams, and now all of a sudden, just, what, six months into his Mavs tenure, they're willing and able to, to look at moving him. Milwaukee would, again, have to get that Grant Williams version that beat them in the playoffs a couple of years. The guy that is that can guard uh, power forwards, can guard centers, can help Milwaukee go small, can knock down threes when that opportunity presents itself. You know he's not going to uh, create shots for himself. How would he fit in the locker room? I wonder, would he be welcomed in the locker room? He can be the guy where your teammates love him and opponents hate him. He can also be the guy where your team hates him and opponents hate him. Um, He can kind of get under people's skin. So how would he fit in that locker room? One idea that was being floated out there by Fisher was Bobby Portis for Grant Williams and possibly a first-round pick from the Mavs, which I 
if you throw in that first, all of a sudden I get a lot more intrigued. I think I would be okay with that because then you would reroute the first somewhere else. So that wouldn't be the only move you make. The only move you make at the trade deadline would not be Bobby Portis for Grant Williams and a first. It'd be Portis for Williams and a first that you would reroute somewhere else. So then you could also get an upgrade on your perimeter. So say uh, they make that deal. We're just going to go pie in the sky. Um, Grant Williams for Bobby Portis in a first, but then you're able to trade, let's just say Bochamp, the uh, Portland second, the first, and Pat Connaughton to the Bulls for Alex Caruso. Let's just throw that out there. All of a sudden, we have a rotation of Damian Lillard, Caruso, Middleton, Giannis, and Brooke as your starters. And then your main guys off the bench look like Malik Beasley, Grant Williams, and... Um, Pat Connaughton or Andre Jackson Jr. Um, since Connaughton got moved in the other deal. Then you can start to work that. You still have a couple of holes. You still need a backup point guard, um, but you can start to work with that. That gives you a very solid seven-man rotation of Lillard. Um, so seven-man rotation of Lillard, Caruso, Middleton, Giannis, Brooke, and then Grant Williams and Malik Beasley. Then you add another piece or two off of the buyout market, and you're you're working there. You're, you're cooking with fire. Uh, P.J. Tucker, he could be a nice buyout candidate. So uh, I digress. Anyway, that Grant Williams, I would potentially do that if you're getting the first back, and then you can reroute it for an upgrade somewhere else. Another player the Bucks are – Interested in reportedly is Dorian Finney-Smith. Uh, Ian Begley of Sportsnet New York reported this because we know Dorian Finney-Smith's name has been out there. The issue is Brooklyn wants at least one first-round pick. I don't know that I would do this deal and Grant Williams deal. There's too much overlap in the minutes that they play, the positions that they play. But that's another player Milwaukee has been connected with. Another Brooklyn net is Royce O'Neal. This one is Michael Scott. No, just kidding. Michael Scotto of Hoops Hype reported the Bucks are interested in Royce O'Neal. He could be kind of a fallback candidate. Royce O'Neal and Dorian Finney-Smith are guys that, depending on the deal, I'd be okay with Milwaukee trading, um, but I wouldn't get excited about it. I wouldn't jump out of, my, out of my seat like I would with maybe some of the other guys, but that might be more of a realistic trade candidate. Michael Scotto of Hoops Hype also reported Isaac Okoro of the Cleveland Cavaliers. He's a guy that would raise my eyebrow a little bit. He's a younger player. He His best basketball hopefully is ahead of him. He's an all-NBA um, all type defensive player, which is intriguing for Milwaukee. He is going to be a restricted free agent, but Milwaukee would retain those bird rights, I believe, to be able to re-sign him. So he would be interesting. The issue is with the Cavs make that move. The Cavs are hot. They have a good team working here, but they might um, make that move to avoid. If they know they're not going to pay him in the offseason, might as well move him for some returns right now. Would they really trade him to Milwaukee, who they are battling for a playoff spot and a division title for? I don't know. But Isaac Okoro is another name that was mentioned. DeLon Wright uh, is the last name that we'll talk about. He was mentioned by Jake Fisher, again, of Yahoo Sports. DeLon Wright... Uh, I would be okay with that, but I don't would not want the Bucks to give up really much of anything. I wouldn't want them to give up their second round pick or a second round pick for that. If that's the best you can do, it might be better waiting for this off season when the Bucks on draft day can trade it. I I think they'll be able to trade two first and whatever seconds they have. Like you can get a lot better option than a Delon Wright. Uh, he's what would play if Damian Lillard is playing 10 or 40 minutes in the playoffs, DeLon Wright's going to have eight, maybe 12. If you play them alongside each other for a few minutes, like I don't want to give up a second for a guy who's going to play eight to 12 minutes in the postseason. I want more of a guy who can get at least 15, 20 minutes for the playoffs. That's just me. Overall, uh, Jake Fisher also reported the Bucks are trying to get creative to free up assets. We know they only have the Trailblazers' 2024 second. We know they only have uh, their own 2027 second as tradable picks. So they're attempting to trade uh, future first-round pick swaps or packages of second-round picks to acquire those extra firsts. Uh, last, last year, last summer, the Suns dealt two future first swaps to the Grizzlies, for three seconds, uh, in order to free up some, so in order to free up some of those draft assets, would Milwaukee trade two seconds for a future first in order to meet the asking price of some of these teams? John Horst, let him cook. Let him cook. We know he's going to get something done. Milwaukee's reportedly been one of the most aggressive teams at the trade deadline. 
they're going to do everything they can to get to get a deal done here. We'll see if any other team wants to play ball with what they have. It, this is kind of a fun time. Um, hopefully it get, becomes more fun, funner, more fun, uh, with some wins here on Thursday and Friday. But the trade deadline is Thursday. Keep your ear plugged in. I'll come back on Friday, maybe Thursday night. We'll see. If the Bucks make a big move, maybe we'll drop an emergency pod here. Otherwise, come back on Friday with takes on whatever deals the Bucks made. I'm, I'm not going to say if they make a deal. I'm, I'm going to phrase it as when they make a deal. All right. Thank you all for tuning in. You can find me on Twitter at Bucks Film Room. Catch you next time with an episode, hopefully recapping the Bucks' exciting trade deadline. 